Welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. This is Craig McConnell, and um, we want to begin a four-part series here where John and I were actually interviewed by a a good friend and an ally, Michael Kusick. And uh, Michael heads up a ministry called Restoring the Soul, and you can find out more about his ministry, which provides soul care for Christian leaders by going to RestoringTheSoul.com. He's a good friend, good ally, and he asked to interview John and I about the message of Ransomed Heart. And we sat down for about an hour and just enjoyed the interview, and he posted the interview on his website, and uh, we asked permission if we could just cut it up and spread it over podcasts on our website. So this is the first segment of an interview, Michael Kusick, Restoring the Soul with John Eldridge and myself on the message of Ransomed Heart. Um, thanks again for meeting John Eldridge and Craig McConnell. Um, John, I wanted to start with a question to you first. You are known kind of throughout the United States and the world as the guy that wrote Wild at Heart, and yet what you do here at Ransomed Heart is so much bigger than that. What's the message of Ransomed Heart? I think somewhere we even have a mission statement. No, I'm not sure. Uh, But it goes like this, Michael. Um, We want to recover the treasure of the gospel. We want to see it restore the lives of men and women deeply, Mm. heal them as men and women. And then through that restoration and through the recovery of the gospel, teach them how to walk intimately with God. Mm. That's, That's what we're about. And I think kind of our core expertise is we're heart surgeons. Hmm. We understand the human heart. God's given us uh, a training and a background and an ability to help people who are wounded or captive or lost or shut down or, or frankly, deeply, profoundly broken at the level of the heart. We are passionate about seeing them restored so we would kind of hail Isaiah 61 as one of our, you know, core passages as a ministry, the Spirit of the Lord, you know, upon us to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, and to set the captive free. And we would just simply add, that's all of us, hmm. <laughs> you know, that yeah. that's, that's not like a select group of people, oh, the grieving, you know, oh, you know, those who have experienced, you know, childhood trauma or, you know, sort of a thing, I think. Yeah. So brokenness is a uh, just a part of the human condition, no matter what family you grew up in. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, have you met anyone that isn't at some no. level? No. Craig, um, John talked about the treasures of the gospel. What are we missing in the gospel as it's typically understood in the evangelical world? Oh, gosh. Um, first things that just fire off to me is... Just even the whole concept of there being a larger story, that there's this this huge epic story of a a life and death battle over our hearts and that we play a you know, this large role in this unfolding drama of God going after and rescuing others. Uh, another quick thought is is simply that the the gospel I knew and preached as a pastor for years, Michael, was uh uh, gospel that was primarily simply forgiveness, hmm. and as much as we need that, as grateful as we are for that, that the the full work of Christ, uh, His resurrection, His delivering us from the works of the devil and evil, uh, the ascension, our having authority, um, just the death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, and and what that brings to us as people is a huge part of that, that there's, uh, you know, it's a gospel of there's much awaiting us in heaven, but there's much more now, significant healing, change, transformation in every area of our life. It's available now. It's not postponed and we don't wait for it all, though we wait for much. Much is available. So you're both really talking about a gospel of restoration. Can you comment on that, John? Yeah, deeply. I think if you look at all the miracles of Christ, um, most of them are illustrations of restoration. In that, First off, the miracles are not random proofs that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, they're not just sort of thrown in there to, 
uh, add credibility to his his person. They're illustrations for the sermon. Mm-hmm. Okay, Jesus is bringing a message to mankind, and then he's demonstrating it with power, uh, with dramatic, with dramatic effect. You know, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf yes. hear, the leper is cleansed, the dead are raised. That. You know, in all of those scenarios, what you have is restoration. Wherever humanity is broken, Christ and the presence of Jesus Christ, his life, his kingdom, you know, what he's showing us is I want to restore you. Mm. I want, you know, body, soul, and spirit. It's As Craig was saying, it's not just a gospel of forgiveness and heaven later. It is a, is a gospel of when when you get plugged back into the vine. You, O oh branch, who have no life in yourself apart from the vine, Jesus is saying, but man, you plug back into me. There is profound life that, that the life of God flows through us as human beings, and that life brings substantial restoration. You know, and I use the word substantial because, no, it's not all now. You know, we're not trying to uh, preach a gospel that it's all now. Obviously, much of it comes later. But there is so much more substantially that's available now that um, many good people live without. Why do you think that we've lost this message as a central part of the gospel, the message that there's more available? I think um, – let me first describe all that has been lost. It's really quite stunning. For example, you start with – um, the kind of relationship that the disciples had with Jesus or the kind of relationship that Abraham had with God, that Joseph, David, Daniel, you know, there is a conversational intimacy uh, that is available between God and his people that's meant to be normative for the Christian life. That's um, That's been lost. Most Christians do not experience that. God is distant. He's respected, he's revered, but he isn't present much. And so we are left on our own to muddle through, which is really how most Christians experience their Christian life. It's that I'm forgiven, but I'm mostly here to behave well, choose a moral life, Hmm. uh, which is a better life than an immoral life. Choose a moral life, serve Christ, share the gospel with others. Um, But the joys of intimacy with God are not common. Um, That's not norm right now. Something else that's been lost is an understanding that um, evil is personal. It's real. There is a personal devil that that he has minions, uh, you know, and and in Revelation when it describes him being thrown to the earth, you know, it says that he went off to make war against the people of God, that that the scriptures assume a great spiritual battle. But when you remove that from the Christian life, then you have a whole category that's been um, kind of obliterated for most Christians, and they're left to try and wrestle with evil as either something that God desires or intends or is using to discipline them or is just them. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm the creep. I'm the jerk. You know, it's me. Right. And so, you know, once again, I'm at the cross. Once again, I'm asking forgiveness. But you take away these things. You take away conversational intimacy with God. You take away warfare. These core categories of the gospel. That's why we don't have a gospel of restoration. That's why we don't. You know, much has been stolen from the church over time. That's nothing new. You know, you read Galatians, Paul is absolutely bewildered. You know, he's, hey, I don't get it. He's stumbling through the whole letter to say, how could you have possibly abandoned the gospel that you heard to, you know, having begun in the spirit? He says, are you now trying to be perfected by human efforts? How could these guys be turning back to the Levitical law after having experienced Jesus Christ? So it's not new. The, The church is constantly losing the gospel. And uh, we're just in an era where what most Christians understand, you know, they have one, like one-third of one-third of the gospel. They have the cross. They don't have the resurrection or the ascension. And even of all the work that the cross does, they only have a piece of that, and that's pardon, you know. And then they wonder why the Christian life isn't anything like they hoped it would be. 
They either blame themselves or they blame God. So what it comes down to. Can you unpack a little bit the resurrection and the ascension, those last two-thirds? Can you kind of summarize the core <clears throat> idea of that? Well, Paul does in Romans. I mean, it's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, starting with Romans 5, you know, he begins to explain to us. He says in Romans 5, if we have been reconciled, to the Father through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, how much more Hmm. will we be saved by his life? Hmm. Okay, and then a little bit later in 5 of Romans, he goes on to say that those who receive God's gift of righteousness and the abundance of his grace will reign in life through Jesus Christ. And then you go on in chapter 6, and he says these astounding things. He says, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so you too may live a new life. That same power is available to you. And so he goes on in in verse 11 of chapter 6 to say, so consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Yeah. Then Romans 8, 1, right? Um, A new power is in operation is how Peterson translates Mm -hmm. it in the message. A new power is in operation, right? That the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. So... Um, I believe that the atonement, I believe the ransom, the purchase of mankind comes through the cross, along with many other things. But but the life, you see, you share in his resurrection also, that the resurrection of Jesus is as much for the Christian as the cross is. In fact, it was Willard uh, who mm-hmm. pointed out, right, that mm-hmm. the cross wasn't even used as the symbol of Christianity for the first 300 years, mm-hmm. which is a fairly stunning historical fact. The reason why is that they were absolutely captured by the resurrection. They'd seen thousands of people crucified. Mm. They had witnessed that. That was not something unusual to their culture. Only one of them had come back, <laughs> you know. And so it was the power of a life, an inextinguishable life. It was the power of his life available to us. Um, that's how we participate in the resurrection and then the ascension. Paul says the most astounding thing at the end of Ephesians 1. He describes how God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. God placed all things under his feet and made him to be head over everything. And then listen to this phrase, for the church, Hmm. which is his body, Hmm. the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In other words, the authority that was given to Jesus Christ is for the benefit of the church. And then you go on in chapter 2 of Ephesians in verse 6, and Paul explains, you have been raised with Christ and seated with him at the right hand of the Father, meaning you now participate in, you are meant to enjoy and enforce, you know, the benefits of the authority of Jesus. And this can be so immensely helpful Hmm. You know, wherever you are as a Christian, business, home, ministry, enterprise, to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the authority of Jesus over what you're doing, it's a resource that I just – it breaks my heart that Christians don't know that that's available to them. And those two things, the resurrection and the ascension, for, for my most of my Christian life, I've just kind of seen those as historical facts that are add-ons to the cross. Exactly. It, it, it's an afterwards, right? It's, yeah. it's kind of post-game wrap-up. Yeah, but there's something really, really powerful and essential there for living the Christian life and walking with God. Well, you go back to Genesis. I mean, you go back to the original design. You know, God gives Adam the earth. He gives him authority over the earth. And Satan was not created as, quote, the prince of this world. He became Mm -hmm. the prince of this world when Adam abdicated his authority. Through his sin, Adam handed over the keys, right? So Satan tempts Jesus, you know, in the wilderness by offering him the kingdoms of the world. You know, uh, he's not offering something that wasn't his to give in that Mm -hmm. moment. He was, the, you know, through man's fall, you know, there was an abdication of authority. And so the recovery of that, you know, just goes back to, well, what's man's design? I mean, we're meant to be God's regents in the world. We're meant to bring the abundance and the authority and, yes, the holiness and morality and all of it of God's kingdom into our kingdoms, and that through the authority of Jesus. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. It certainly gave you the opportunity to learn a little bit more about just Ransomed Heart, our message, who we are, what we're after, and for a whole lot more information and some of the resources we have. Of course, you know you can get that by going to ransomedheart.com. Join us next time we gather in this virtual world of podcasting. 
and we'll do part two of an interview. And uh, thanks for listening.